Tonight, sky-high problems. Any falsification of those documentations, which could basically cover up uh, a safety issue, is, is a major problem. Boeing's concerns go far beyond the MAX 8. We've got the Canadian connection and what officials here are doing about it. It is as clear as the nose on my face exactly who they're talking about. A Canadian anti-hate group's warning about a would-be political party. Plus, at issue season ender previews a packed political summer. And we're live all night as world leaders meet in Japan. Can Justin Trudeau get some G20 traction with China? This is The National. Your safety as an airline passenger on certain planes has essentially been negotiated between a U.S. regulator and a manufacturer with a disturbing history. Boeing is already in the spotlight for two catastrophic crashes. Now we're learning its safety record was recently so damning, so ingrained, that Boeing needed to negotiate a unique arrangement with the Federal Aviation Administration. Katie Nicholson shows us how it came to be and what it means for you. Soaring from continent to continent, the Boeing 787 Dreamliner is a crown jewel of Air Canada's fleet. But in 2015, one of its planes sprung a fuel leak. Work that was supposed to have been done at the Boeing plant wasn't. Michael Laris says it's part of a long and troubling pattern. People involved in making the Boeing airplanes would falsify um, their responses on documents saying what they've done. Today, he reported on a 2015 deal struck between Boeing and the Federal Aviation Authority to settle a number of investigations. In return, it agreed to improve systemic safety issues. Workers were improperly installing wires in 787s. They failed to insert lock wires to help keep bolts in place, and special decompression panels were improperly installed. And that's important because they're there to make sure that if there's a a terrible emergency that the floor doesn't get sucked out. As for those falsified documents that led to Air Canada's fuel leak, Boeing says after Air Canada reported it, Boeing self-disclosed to the Federal Aviation Authority and conducted an audit, concluding it was an isolated event. It says it took immediate corrective action. The internal parts of the turbine engine, the temperatures can be upwards around 700 degrees. So needless to say, it doesn't take very much for that uh, uh, liquid, be it flammable such as fuel, to be ignited. This aviation safety expert says the disconcerting revelations must be addressed. What is happening within the culture within the organization? Are, is there indeed measurable changes taking place and are they consistent? Are they ongoing? And then secondly, somebody needs to go back and take a hard look at all the various airplanes. Including planes that fly in Canada. Transport Canada says it's still evaluating how this information will affect how it approves aircraft in the country. Laris has his own evaluation. It raises questions about the patterns of all those cases. I mean, essentially, how could they, how could they keep happening? A case in point, perhaps, the discredited software that's blamed for those two fatal crashes. So Katie joins us now. So Katie, we have an Air Canada jet that was part of Boeing's poor safety record. So what are they saying today? Well, after reporting that fuel leak to Boeing back in 2015, Air Canada says it immediately inspected the rest of its 787 fleet and found that was the only 787 with that particular problem. And it says it regularly inspects its fleet and fully complies with regulations. Okay, so there are other Canadian airlines, though. What are they saying? Well, WestJet has flown the Dreamliner since February of this year without any incidents. It noted today it says it has full confidence in the safety of its Dreamliners, and WestJet also says it really can't speak to the FAA findings because it's not really privy to those reports. Okay, Katie, thanks very much. Something else for travelers to keep tabs on. Air Canada has made a bid to buy a competitor. Today, Air Transat's management said yes. The offer is worth $520 million or $13 a share, but the real question is the potential impact on you. Alison Northcott got some answers. 
Air Canada and Air Transat say their agreement is good for travellers, employees and shareholders. The airlines say Air Transat would keep its separate brand and its own Montreal head office. But details about prices, available flights and jobs are scarce. Air Canada's CEO foresees increased job security for both companies' employees through greater growth prospects. Air Transat says its customers will have more choices and possibilities. But one consumer advocate sees a less rosy picture. This is bad news for consumers, for uh, passengers. We are concerned about the monopolistic effect on the market. We have very few airlines. Each of them control a very large chunk of the market. This is making that situation worse. Still, with WestJet recently sold to Onyx, some analysts say consumers could benefit from increased competition between the two carriers, just don't count on lower prices. Air Canada is going to need to get the cost of this acquisition somehow. They're going to have more pricing power. Let me put it this way, as a consumer, I wouldn't be expecting a price reduction. It is possible, but it's really going to be done, if anything, in response to any actions by WestJet. For travellers at Pearson Airport today, one question was top of mind. Right, does that limit options as far as sales go? If they control both, does that mean that transact flight prices will start to creep up again? As long as the fares doesn't go up, because they can, their fares are way up there. The airline went ahead with the agreement even with other offers on the table, including one worth a dollar more per share. Considering that our offer is still outstanding at $14, uh, I think they're going to have some challenges to... Uh, to get their shareholders to approve that uh, the deal they signed. The agreement still has to be reviewed by the Competition Bureau and approved by Air Transat shareholders, some of whom say the company is worth more than what Air Canada has offered. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. Now, here's the kind of publicity an airline does not need when it's up for sale. This video shows Air Transat passengers nervously leaving their seats after bugs were spotted skittering down the aisle. Quote, a bug has now fallen from the ceiling into the seat next to me, tweeted one passenger. Lovely. Their presence ended up delaying, yuck, the London to Vancouver flight for a day. They appear to be some kind of beetle. When Canadians head to the polls in less than four months, they'll see a lot of familiar party names. But tonight, some people are concerned that an extremist group will also have official party status. It's called the Canadian Nationalist Party, and CBC News has learned the RCMP is investigating its leader. Dave Seglins looks at how they may get on your ballot and who wants them stopped. Toronto last weekend during gay pride celebrations. Extremists from the political left and right got into a brawl at the downtown Eaton Centre. In the middle of it all, white t-shirts, supporters of the Canadian Nationalist Party, in on the action, attracting this watchdog. The Canadian Nationalist Party is in fact a, a, a hate group. He's filed complaints with police claiming that one of the party's online videos is hate speech and anti-Semitic. Everywhere these people go, they infiltrate the media, they hijack the central bank, remove these people once and for all from our country. The kind of tropes that Jews have been subject to for much of our collective lives um, has been exactly the words used uh, by uh, Mr. Patron in this video. Controlling the media, controlling the entertainment business. The Canadian Nationalist Party is Christian-based and anti-immigrant, according to its website. Elections Canada has given its leader until mid-July to submit 250 signatures, all it takes to become an official political party. It's my hope that we can also begin issuing tax receipts. Can you imagine if neo-Nazi organizations and hate organizations such as the Canadian Nationalist Party are able to give charitable receipts uh, as a political party? That scares the living daylights out of me. He says Elections Canada should ban them. Now, CBC News has learned that the RCMP has launched an investigation and called in hate crime specialists. The party's leader insists he's done nothing wrong and says that his members follow a code of conduct. You will not incite violence. You will not use hateful language, and you will dress professionally. This expert says there's little stopping an extremist group if it wants to run in an election. They have to have a certain number of signatures. But after that, it is not Elections Canada 
job to decide who or who should not become a political party. The Canadian Nationalist Party says it has more than enough signatures and expects to be approved by midsummer. Now, Elections Canada says neither the police investigation nor the group's extreme views prohibit it from being eligible for official status in time for this fall's federal election. Dave Seglin, CBC News, Toronto. To the U.S. now, where new information has refocused attention on a sexual assault allegation against Donald Trump made last week by E. Jean Carroll, a New York-based advice columnist. It was dismissed by the U.S. president, and the world seemed to mostly move on. But today, it blasted into the headlines again in, we should tell you, graphic detail. You did say he put his penis in me. And I said, what? He raped you? The New York Times podcast, The Daily, aired an interview with Carol and two friends who recalled conversations with her right after the alleged assault took place. And you said, I, uh, he kept pulling down, he pulled down my tights, he pulled down my tights. And he pulled down the tights. That is the first independent corroboration of Carol's account, which she published in an excerpt of her forthcoming book, what many would describe as rape, but not her. I don't use the word you just used. I use the word fight. That way, I'm not the victim, right? I'm not the victim. I have no idea who this woman is. Trump's response is by now familiar. It never happened, he said. And as if this was proof, also Carol isn't, quote, his type. It is a totally false accusation. I have no idea who these women are. I have no idea. He's heard. used language like that before against some of the other 22 plus women who've come forward with allegations of misconduct. Believe me, she would not be my first choice that I can tell you. Man. As another Trump accuser noted, he really needs a new script, but he's not going to change. And he's gotten away with it. I moved on her like a <laughs> But Carol has credibility to those who remember the way Trump boasted on a hot mic in 2005. When you're a star, they let you do it. You can do anything. <laughs> Whatever you want. Grab him by the <laughs> I can do anything. Once upon a time, a rape allegation against a sitting U.S. president would be front page news for weeks. But after Carol went public with her account, most papers, including the New York Times, initially relegated it to the back pages. They're pure fiction and they're outright lies. Either the accusations are just what Trump says they are, or after years of this, he has perfected the art of damage control. But either way, there is a numbness to unproven accusations now, and accounts like Carol's risk becoming background noise. Now, the next U.S. presidential election is a long way off. The first Democratic primary where they begin selecting the leader who will face Donald Trump isn't until next February. But the race has already unofficially begun as Democratic candidates spar with each other in the first televised debates. So the debates have been split over two nights because there is right now a small army of Democrats vying to take on Trump. These are the candidates for last night's debate alone. And this is the fight ticket tonight. By necessity, it will be a noisy affair because for many candidates, this is a rare chance to get noticed and break out of the pack. Ellen Morrow went to a Democratic strategist and voters to find out what they are looking for. And in the process, she uncovered the Democrats' dilemma. A bar filled with Democrats watching a stage full of hopefuls. Um, I'm definitely team Elizabeth Warren right now. My candidate of choice would definitely be Joe Biden. The slate of Democratic candidates is long. Ten hit the stage last night, ten more tonight. So much for voters to consider. There's a lot of people out there that would vote Democratic if the messaging was right. But what is the right message? For some candidates, it's policy. Healthcare is a basic human right. For others, it's more about beating Donald Trump. If we give Donald Trump eight years in the White House, he will forever and fundamentally alter the character of this nation. The question is, can you keep the country and the debate focused on uh, issues of substance that matter to Americans. Help us fight back. Yeah, that's good. Mark Longabaugh creates Democratic so, so, so campaign ads and worked for Bernie Sanders in 2016. 
He says it's not enough to just be anti-Trump. That policy will win in 2020. If you're in the personal gutter with, with Donald Trump, you're losing. If you're on the policy side of the debate uh, as a Democrat with Donald Trump, you're winning and you're winning big. But Biden is currently the front runner. As a moderate, his supporters argue he's the most electable. The party's progressives say he won't excite the left-leaning base. If we sacrifice the, the issues of so many communities, um, I think we depress turnout. And what we need is more people to turn out next year than have ever turned out in America. Back at the bar, Democrats know no matter who they pick, there's only one way to win. Once we do pick a primary candidate, we'll all come together and rally around him or her and really just put our all into getting Donald Trump out of the White House. President Trump's initial reaction to the first debate was one word, boring. A likely preview of the negative campaigning we could see once his opponent is named. Ellen Morrow, CBC News, Washington. Some of the other stories we're following tonight on The National. The U.S. has passed a bill aimed at addressing the humanitarian crisis at the border. The yeas are 305, the nays are 102, the motion is adopted. The bill will provide $4.6 billion to care for migrant refugees detained at the southern border, including shelter and food. That bill now goes to the president to be signed into law. And Canada's Western premiers gathered in Edmonton today, including those from B.C. and Alberta. They are opponents on the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion, which got the federal green light just last week. I uh, indicated to, uh, to Premier Horgan our, our hope that uh, the government of British Columbia will respect the uh, decisions that have been made. Those are issues that we disagree on, but that doesn't mean we can't have a robust discussion. Next month, all of Canada's premiers will meet in Saskatoon. And Canadian naval ships were buzzed by two Chinese fighter jets this week, coming within 300 meters of the ships. It's happened, it happened Monday in international waters in the East China Sea. Despite recent tensions between the two countries, the Department of National Defense said this particular fly pass by the two People's Liberation Army aircraft was not provocative, hazardous, or unexpected. And that is Justin Trudeau making his entrance for the start of the G20 summit in Japan. He's joining other world leaders in Osaka. It's about a quarter past 11 Friday morning there right now. Later this hour, we are expecting the traditional family photo before the leaders head into a closed session. Now at the center of that summit, major trade talks, including those between China and the U.S. As Evan Dyer explains, when those two leaders get together, the whole world will be watching, especially Canada. One of the most anticipated events at this Group of 20 summit is going to be the bilateral meeting between President Xi of China and President Donald Trump. We're expecting that to take place on Saturday, and we're hearing early reports that there may be some kind of a breakthrough or at least a truce in the tariff war between those two countries. This would take the form of a delay or an extension in the imposition of the second wave of U.S. tariffs that Donald Trump has threatened against China. This affects about $30 billion of Chinese imports that so far have not had to face U.S. tariffs. It is all uh, Chinese imports that are at stake in the, under this tariff threat here. Uh, if a delay were to be achieved, though, it would be far from a final resolution. In fact, it would be a very similar situation to the one we saw at the Group of 20 summit last year in Argentina, where the two agreed to a delay of 90 days. Uh, but at the end of those 90 days, tariffs were indeed imposed. And we also saw the two sides giving somewhat different interpretations of the truce, the agreement that they had reached. So uh, you can count on other countries parsing very closely any statement that comes out of this uh, trump Xi meeting, because this is a trading relationship that affects the whole world. Other countries, of course, pretty much spectators in that bilateral arrangement. Uh, but Canada, more perhaps than others, because Canada has a second issue uh, that is very important in that Xi-Trump summit, and that's the question of whether President Trump will follow through on his promise to raise the issue of two Canadian detainees held by China, as he told Justin Trudeau in the Oval Office about a week ago. Canadian officials say they are optimistic that he will raise the issue. 
less optimistic that that will lead to an immediate breakthrough, uh, lacking some kind of a grand bargain in the trade war between the U.S. and China and a resolution of the Meng Wanzhou case. Uh, President, uh, Prime Minister Trudeau this morning is going to meet with one of the countries that has benefited from the U.S.-China trade war, and that's Vietnam, which has seen its imports to the U.S. spike dramatically, even as Chinese imports have gone down as a result of tariffs. Evan Dyer, CBC News, Osaka. Still ahead on the national, the Osaka grandmas taking over the G20, their message to world leaders in our moment. But first, getting to the bottom of China's meat ban, why food fraud is likely to blame. Your, your passport, your driver's license, uh, all of that can be uh, faked, copied. So documents that move with shipments, uh, whether it's physical or electronic, it's very, very easy to fake those documents. So pigs like those won't be headed to China anytime soon. Neither will any other kind of Canadian meat. China has banned it all after finding fake Canadian inspection certificates on an imported pork product. Experts say this looks like food fraud, scammers trading on Canada's reputation for their own profit. As Mike Crawley tells us, it's an industry worth billions around the globe. What do Canadian pigs have in common with designer handbags? Both are targets of counterfeiters. Canadian meat is highly valued across Asia. That makes a Canadian meat inspection certificate valuable too. Fake certificates allow shady businesses to fetch a higher price for their phony products. Food fraud is a global problem. It's estimated about $49 billion worldwide, and we have organized crime that are at the, uh, at the core of this. John Keogh just spent six years in Asia as a food supply chain consultant. How easy is it to fake a Canadian food export certificate? Your, your passport, your driver's license, uh, all of that can be uh, faked, copied. So documents that move with shipments, uh, whether it's physical or electronic, it's very, very easy to fake those documents. Keo believes the contaminated pork shipment that triggered China to ban imports of all Canadian meat probably originated in China. Could it have been a fake product from a local source? Um, it's highly unlikely that it came from Canada. To know for certain, Canadian officials need to get their hands on a sample of the meat from the shipment in question. Tests can prove what the pigs were actually fed and much more. We can also do DNA fingerprinting of the actual product itself and see if the animal is physically from Canada. We're going to get to the bottom of it and we want to resolve this as fast as we can. Chinese officials say the pork was treated with ractopamine, an additive that nearly all Canadian pig farmers stopped using six years ago. We want to understand where this uh, pork originated from, who's involved, uh, as so that we can move forward and, frankly, uh, continue and regain market access into, uh, into China. The branch of the RCMP that's handling the case also deals with international corruption and cybersecurity, a hint of how challenging this investigation could be. Mike Crawley, CBC News, Toronto. Still ahead on The National. Rosie and the Ad Issue gang are here. On the agenda, the big issues that could shape the election campaign. Plus, these guys take some of your questions. It's very hot. It's very hot. Um, but we're enjoying it, trying to get suntan. Much of Europe is sweltering through a heat wave right now. Germany, France, Poland and the Czech Republic all recorded their highest ever temperatures for June. In Spain, parts of the country were expected to reach 45 degrees. The high temperatures are hampering efforts to fight a forest fire in Catalonia. At least 65 square kilometers are burning out of control, but firefighters warn that blaze will likely grow in the coming days. And a disturbing mystery is once again unfolding on Canada's east coast. Tonight, the body of another North Atlantic right whale was discovered drifting off of Quebec's Gaspé Peninsula. That brings this year's death toll to six, and it's raising fears of a repeat of 2017 when 12 endangered whales were found dead in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. And the cropsy for the third whale found is set for Friday.
It's been a busy six months in politics. It feels like a lot longer. All leading up to the federal election now just months away. So what issues should we continue to keep a close eye on during the summer months? Which ones could shape the election campaign? What better group to tackle this than these guys? At issue here for our last panel of the season. Oh, my God, somebody touch wood. Before we take a little hiatus, Chantal Hébert, Andrew Coyne, Althea Raj, Paul Wells, all here in Toronto. And I... I may call you during the summer. You don't have to answer, but it's, there's a good <laughs> chance I'll probably call you. Anyway, um, let, I, I just want to frame it around, uh, you know, heading into the election and how these issues may or may not uh, affect um, an election. So let's start with Canada's uh, problems with China. So I guess this is really our overall approach to foreign policy, but in particular, uh, how things have uh, deteriorated, I guess, with China. Here's some of what the prime minister said after meeting with President Trump. I also spoke at length with the President about the wrongful detention of two Canadian citizens in China and continue to call for their immediate release. I know that foreign policy generally doesn't affect uh, voters. It's not something people keep in mind when they go to the polls. But when you see how a leader is, has handled the China file, is that something that people will be thinking about uh, as we, you know, over barbecues and whatnot? The, 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 whether you agree with what he's done or not. Yeah, I can go to the questions of uh, judgment and competence in the Prime Minister. There's been a number of files where I think people would say the Prime Minister has not been particularly at his best when it comes to the Trans-Pacific Partnership, for example, or uh, um, the India trip, et cetera. Uh, and it, it, when, when his vulnerability is that sense that maybe he's in over his head, to use a line from the past, uh, then, then that's, that's germane. I don't think you can fault him for his handling of this specific question yeah, of yeah. the Canadians in China. That's a very, very delicate thing. I, don't, I can't fault them at all. I think the larger point that could be made is this government was very naive slash cynical about China in its first years. It had this kind of amateur geopolitics of it was going to that that China was the rising power, the U.S. was the fading power. We were going to align ourselves Free trade more closely agreement, with them. Trade agreement, all that. Yeah. And I think a lot of people would say uh, that was very ill advised that they had not taken stock of the changes that have been happening under Xi in China, and that this is a, a very different um, uh, beast that we're dealing with than we might have imagined five, ten years ago. Although I remember yeah, Harper uh, too but, had but, hot and cold but, with China, but I'm, right? I, yeah. I'm guessing all those great foreign policy thinkers who spent the Harper decade saying Harper wasn't doing the right thing and wasn't engaging this China have all disappeared yes. under yep. this table <laughs> somewhere. Uh, and suddenly Justin Trudeau was naive and he should have known uh, when, as far as I can tell, they spent a decade writing off ads to say uh, Harper is not engaging to, and to should be, be clear, engaging. I was about writing those up. No, 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 <laughs> I'm not saying, I, I, I'm talking about those foreign policy yeah, yeah. wonks yes. who yeah, yeah. Yeah. seem to always have a better advice to second guessing yes. the government of the day. I think on this issue, um, a lot of Canadians are going to give a lot of a bit of a pass to Justin Trudeau because they're going to say it's ultimately Donald Trump's fault. Yeah. Uh, with the, the Trump trade war with China, with the kind of language between the two, I think it's pretty clear that we are bit players in a, in a drama that we did not seek. And to this day, I still think the India trip uh, is better um, weapon for the opposition sure. and has stuck more than any of these files. Uh, and the fact that, but the fact that he can't get anybody on the phone, the fact that they don't yeah. want to talk to him, I mean, those aren't, I, I realize it's China and that's hard, it's hard to manage, but I don't know what that says. There, there's, voters. there's parts of this that are almost like a Russian novel. I mean, the, the idea that the Trudeau family has a special relationship with China runs deep yeah. in the psyche of, of people named Trudeau. Uh, <laughs> it was his dad who opened up di uh, diplomatic relations with, uh, with Beijing. Uh, his brother ha has written a, a, essentially a travelogue book about what fascinating people the Chinese are. And Justin Trudeau, within weeks of announcing his candidacy in 2012 for the Liberal leadership, was writing op-eds saying, essentially, China's the key to our prosperity and I'm the key to China. China is... A, a big riddle facing every Western country. And I think we've had more sophisticated d discourse about that in most other Western countries than we've had lately in Canada. Hmm. I think that actually on foreign affairs, the Prime Minister has done a pretty good job. When you look at the relationship being managed with the President of the United States, 
Uh, the fact that both parties, both major parties, conservatives and liberals, are basically singing from the same songbook when it comes to China, it's hard to imagine how Andrew Scheer would be approaching the situation any differently. That's why I don't really think it's going to play in the election. Yeah. In a way that we might see foreign affairs play in the election is actually through diaspora politics. And we don't really talk that much about that, uh, and maybe we should, but there's definitely uh, issues happening in the Indian community, whether it's with the Hindu community and Sikh community, or uh, how the conservatives typically target the Chinese community. There may be messages that we are not aware of that are being played kind of below the surface in uh, mother tongues that we don't actually realize until perhaps weeks mm. into the campaign. Uh, I want to talk about climate and pipelines because uh, obviously after the past couple of weeks, that's the conversation. Is the election going to be about climate and energy and how we balance those two things? I think I have a clip here of, of the fine line the government uh, has tried to walk in all of this. Those who want sustainable energy and a cleaner environment know that I want that too. But in order to bridge the gap between where we are and where we're going, we need money to pay for it. That, of course, the announcement that the government is, is going ahead with TMX. Um, I don't know. I have a hard time thinking that the, uh, that the election will center around that issue, but maybe I'm being naive. Maybe it depends who you are. I, I don't know. Yeah, um, yeah. I can't answer that no. question, yeah. but I, 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 I've been looking at the pipeline decision uh, and the way that it came across and, and I've been thinking that over the past few months uh, from Rachel Notley to Jason Kenney there's been a, a shift in the paradigm of the discussion to from pipelines to national unity yes. and I'm not sure that uh, Jason Kenney would be happy about that but I believe that it has helped Justin Trudeau make this decision more politically palatable mm. uh, that the optics is not just I choose pipelines and I choose but it's also uh, I choose what helps national unity, mm -hmm. or at least uh, by reframing it that yeah. way, they have actually made it easier to sell to Canadians who may have had the knee-jerk reaction of saying, pipelines bad, climate change good. Mm -hmm. I've been saying for some time it will not be as central as I think some people are imagining, partly because any issue that's that big, people can see coming a mile away, and what you've been seeing is the parties moving closer together. You saw the Liberals covering themselves off by m making sure they approve Trans Mountain Pipeline so they can continue with this, we're, we're okay with development as well as uh, dealing with climate change. And you see the Conservatives coming out with a plan, however uh, flawed it may be, uh, but to show that they're somewhere in the mainstream in that debate as well. So partly for that reason, partly because of the regional dynamics of this. Uh, if you're in Alberta or Saskatchewan, you've made up your mind, you're not going to be voting Liberal. And you, you, this issue is not going to be... Uh, up, up for grabs right. in play. Right. And similarly, in, in Quebec and British Columbia, you're probably not going to be uh, uh, hugely affected. Where it can, I think, be germane is in Ontario. Uh, and I think because it's, it, to some extent, it goes to questions of Ontario's identity. Is Ontario a province like British Columbia and Quebec? Is it a kind of a modern, urban uh, province with, with, uh, with sort of progressive uh, uh, ideas about these things? Or is it more like a Alberta province? Is it more yeah. like a, you know, is, what's its sense of itself, I think, is partly what's, what's up for grabs here. Is it progressive or is it, Yeah, or is, it, or is it conservative? Yeah. Or does it want a friend of the premier that it doesn't like uh, <laughs> as prime minister? Yeah. Very well. basic question. One thing that's been interesting and that'll be worth watching through the campaign is that there's elements of the Trudeau electoral base of 2015 that have essentially radicalized or that don't buy the compromises that Trudeau is selling. Have gone further on, left, you mean? Uh, yeah, on electoral reform, on indigenous reconciliation, uh, uh, to some extent on gender. Uh, not they radicalized, but they think that Trudeau has sold out. And, uh, and on the environment. Um, Look, the selling point for Trans Mountain is that there's plenty of room for something like this within Canada's uh, emission caps. And a lot of the comment that I saw on social media was, who cares about your emission caps? We're trying to save the planet here. You just told us we're in a climate emergency. And, uh, and, and so... Which they did on Monday night. Yeah, which is... And so that's why we're seeing the NDP and the Greens both competitive with the, with the Liberals in British Columbia. And it'll be interesting to see whether Trudeau can call those voters home in a polarized election. I think that different issues will play for different parts of the electorate. And will millennials vote on the environment? Perhaps. Will women vote on the environment? Perhaps. What I am surprised by uh, in the plans that the parties have laid out, 
um, is that they're not really surprising at all. No. The liberals have always tried to be this Goldilocks, like not too hot, not too cold, right in the middle. And anybody paying any attention knew that the Trans Mountain was going to be approved. And uh, to Chantal's point, he could have gone and taken a hard left stance and said, you know, I made this declaration initially approving Trans Mountain because of Rachel Notley and her environmental plan and her price on carbon and how she was going to attack coal and the 100 megaton cap on the oil sands. And now Jason Kenney is not giving me a firm cap. And um, well, now he's kind of silent on it. But he's not come out and said, yes, I fully support the Rachel Notley plan, the price on carbon, we're imposing it. That I'm, I am going to take a hard left. I'm going to go after those voters that Paul talked about, and we're going to we're going to chase the rest of those new Democrats and bring them to the liberal fold. And instead, he went with his traditional viewpoint, which we, if you look at the speeches he's given in the past, it is really about national unity. Like I don't think Justin Trudeau gets up in the morning and thinks about the environment. I think he thinks about national unity. That is the one thing that has been consistent uh, in all of his public declarations over the last couple of decades. But it's not about the pl country splintering. It's about well, how am I helping the whole how country? How do you help pull you? the country I, together? I think it's about how do I win this election. Well, okay, fine, I agree. I, I, I win this election by trying to stay on the center ground on this debate. And yeah. if he had done that, he would have given up this, the center yes, ground. Yes. Totally. Oh, absolutely. He, he, could go after, he could go after the Liberal and, and the NDP and Green vote if he had a really scary conservative party. That he could say, you have to you have to come to the liberal to corral. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. But what I don't. But do. what you've been seeing Sheer doing over the last couple of weeks is making himself materially less scary. Those yes. series of speeches yeah. were all very reassuringly mainstream because he could see that the liberal the liberal vote on the hold in the center was a little bit vulnerable because of the SNC Lavalin stuff. Uh, okay. But I, this is also the fulfillment of that promise: the environment and the economy go hand in hand. Hard to yes, go back yeah. to the polls if you don't improve the pipeline. Yeah. Okay, thanks everyone. We're going to be back, back with another round of At Issue after the break. This time, it's your turn to ask the questions. Hi, At Issue. My question for you is... My question for tonight, the panel is... Question to At Issue. My question for the At Issue panel is... Just some of the many viewers who sent in their questions this past season. You're not answering all of those tonight. We wanted to get to a few tonight. At Issue back for another round. Chantal, Andrew, Althea, and Paul all with me in Toronto. Okay, let's start with Connor Peters. Here's his question. Why is the PPC polling so low, and what threat do they really pose to Conservatives in October? Okay, why is the People's Party polling so low? Are they a threat? Paul. Maxine Bernier is a bad campaigner so far. You, you gather support by reaching out to people, by appealing to them, by giving them hope for a future. Uh, Maxine Bernier spends his time on Twitter complaining about the, his coverage. Um, I honestly expected he would uh, have rallied more support by now. I don't know whether he can rally more support this fall. Can't you rally support by making people angry, though? Didn't Donald Trump show us that? Isn't that what he's trying to do? Yes, but you've got to uh, be ang to make a lot of people angry about things that they could be angry about, like economic insecurity. Right. That's not where it's this is going. Yeah. And when Maxime Bernier says, I'm the free speech guy, so we can have a debate about abortion, he may be winning some votes there, but he is also turning off a whole bunch of people who are saying, I'm not going to vote for a guy who wants to go down that road. And he's done that with uh, immigration. He's done that with a number of issues that were not as forte during the leadership campaign. No. It's been a Jekyll and Hyde thing. Yes. Uh, from a very economic candidate to uh, someone who seems to really want to be popular with what I would call the friends of the conservative movement. I think there's a number of factors. One is the candidate himself, Maxime Bernier, is not a particularly impressive character. He, he's a, he looks good on paper, but when you actually get into the the meat of the substance, he's, he's not a particularly impressive person. Secondly, we're not America. We've not gone through the, the kinds of traumas that they've gone through. We don't have the same constituency for that kind of populist appeal, for, particularly when he goes into anti-immigrant uh, type of rhetoric. It just does not play well. And the third thing I would say is the conservatives who were discontented with the, during the, in the Stephen Harper years because they weren't very small-c conservative, who might have been listening to Maxime Bernier's message, were listening to him during the leadership race, are content enough to stay with the party now because they're so annoyed with Justin Trudeau. I don't think the problem is Maxime Bernier. Mr. Bernier can be uh, quite a charming fellow, and he's willing to talk about policy that he's interested in 
in depth. The problem with the PPC party is that it's shrunk its coalition because it's being seen as appealing to racists. So even if there's things that are interesting in the platform that you may like, maybe you're an anti-abortion person, maybe you're an anti-supply management person, but you don't want to be associated with these wing nuts. So the coalition is too small. Cynthia Thompson, originally from Ottawa, but today sent us this question from Texas to eat barbecue or something. Here she is. <laughs> Hi, at issue. I was curious to know what role climate change will play in the next federal election. Thank you. We sort of went over that, so I'm going to, Cynthia, if you don't mind, just tweak your question slightly. What role will the Green Party play in the next election? Is that the big thing that we it's don't know yet? It's an interesting wild card. It will be interesting to see how vote splits happen. I know liberal, a lot of liberal uh, MPs are worried that their vote will go to the Greens. We saw even in the Outremont by-election, a surprising result from the Greens. Um, on Vancouver Island, what role, especially in South Vancouver Island, are they able to pick up some seats? Uh, what role does Elizabeth May play during the debate? Does she come to help prop up Justin Trudeau, or is she an adversary? Lots of lots of yeah. questions. Could someone please mention the NDP, otherwise I'm going to get an email here about it. Because we have I just but, realized we haven't discussed them at all. But and that maybe is, that's the issue. I mean, pe the calculation was that the NDP was so weak, and it is weak, and it remains weak, uh, that the, the Liberals would win off the NDP weakness. Right. But uh, some of that green vote is Liberal. Mm -hmm. There's no doubt. But sure. some of that green vote is NDP. And those NDP votes are not going to the Liberal. So the first problem... Uh, for the Liberals is figuring that out. That being said, you need a ground game uh, if you're going to win, or you need to select your battles. And I don't think a national campaign will bring uh, the kind of seats. I think what Elizabeth May wants out of this campaign is perhaps the balance of power in a minority yeah. House of Commons. She well, you're not going to get that yeah. with a national campaign no. because even if you, if you carpet that support, it doesn't bring. But you know seats. what? But that that's a good. But maybe the NDP should be playing that game too, well, not doing the whole national thing yeah. and looking for just the places it can win. But that may be the biggest impact they have in the election, and not in a way that perhaps they intend is as a talking point for the Conservatives. Uh, and it's a valid message to say if you're thinking of voting Liberal in a minority government situation, what you may get is not the Liberals, but the Liberals propped up by the Greens. And are you happy with that? perspective, you centrist voters who might be tempted to vote liberal. Okay, I got to leave it. I would sit here for hours with you, as you all know. Thank you for coming. Thank I you appreciate for having it. us. Before we go, be sure to subscribe to Add Issue, the podcast. Look for it on iTunes, any major podcast app, our website, cbcnews.ca slash The National. Up next on The National, they sing, they dance, and they are hoping to welcome world leaders to the G20. Okay, that's pretty catchy. The story behind the Osaka Granny's latest song, that is next in our moment. This is Obachan. That's a Japanese granny idol group. They sing, they dance, they even rap, and they are welcoming world leaders to their hometown of Osaka, Japan. So this group is made up of women in their 60s and 70s, and they created a special song just for the G20 summit, offering the world a peek into their vibrant city. These irresistible singing, rapping grannies. That's our moment. Hey, yo, what's up? Pick up. We are our Japanese idol. Let's talk. Let's dance. Here is Osaka, one of the あの、Okay, so the, um, Obachan means uh, grandmother. It's also a term of endearment, apparently, in Osaka. This group actually formed in 2012. There were auditions for these parts. Huge uh, desire on the parts of uh, the people there to be part of it. And uh, they don't speak a word of English, but all those lyrics were written out phonetically. They did phenomenally well. 
That is a national for June 27th. Good night.